All right, I think we can start this webinar. Um, so hi everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar on co-ops and climate action. Uh, my name is Eva and um, I work for Rebarring London. Uh, I will tell you a bit more about that later, but today I'm also uh, hosting and facilitating this webinar. Um, this webinar is brought to you by The Hive, and The Hive uh, is a business uh, support program for co-ops, uh, and it's delivered uh, in collaboration between Cooperatives UK and the Cooperative Bank. And the idea of this series of webinars is to show you how you can use co-ops to do great things uh, and what kind of support you can get to start a co-op or if you're an existing co-op as well through a business development program like the hive so this is the first of like a series of webinars um and yeah we'll, we're testing this out and i hope you'll find it interesting don't hesitate to post questions in the chat and um yeah i think we can get started Okay, so um, in today's webinar, uh, the idea is to cover a few things. Um, so first, explaining uh, a bit to you what is a cooperative and how it works, and what are the benefits and the advantages of forming cooperatives. And then we will show you some practical examples of cooperatives that um, exist today and work in the climate sector. And we basically want to show you how cooperatives uh, can be a really effective and powerful way to take action on climate change. So we'll have different examples. Uh, I'm going to talk about the work that I do at Repowering London, um, which is a community energy cooperative. Uh, Jonathan from Carbon Co-op in Manchester is going to talk about his work with Carbon Co-op, um, also in the energy sector and the decarbonisation sector. And Ben from the Bristol Wood Recycling Project is going to talk about his co-op. Um, and yeah, we hope you're going to find this inspiring and it's going to give you ideas. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the support that's available from the Hive to start your co-op or to support your existing co-op, um, because this is supposed to be practical and we want to give you um, some advice and like steps that you can take if you want to set up something similar. So that that is what we're going to talk about today. And obviously there'll be some time for questions at the end. So um, yeah. You, but you can also put them in the chat as we go um, or wait until the end. Now I'm going to stop sharing because we want to start by a, a short video explaining to you what is a co-op. Ownership matters. It gives people a say in the things they care about. Did you know if you were a member of a co-op, you are also one of its owners? Originally founded by a group of working class people who were fed up of having to buy poor quality food, co-ops are just as relevant today. They are found in every sector, from high street retailers to farmer controlled businesses, cooperative pubs and credit unions. They are tech platforms, they deliver social care and they're making a huge difference to people, workers and communities across the UK and the world every single day. From the outside, co-ops look like any other business, but inside they are very different. They are owned and controlled together by the people that are closest to the business. Employees, customers, residents, suppliers, not distant shareholders. These people, the members, have an equal say in how the business is run, and they even decide what to do with the profits and cooperatives work. There are thousands of different co-ops in the UK and over 3 million worldwide. Some of our most famous brands come from cooperatives, from champagne and parmesan to Lurpak butter and bird's eye peas. There are even fan-owned football clubs. Co-ops contribute billions of pounds each year to the UK economy and boost UK productivity, innovation and entrepreneurship. And they work for the millions of members who together own the UK's co-ops. Cooperatives give people, in fact, all of us, more control over the things that matter. Because ownership matters. In a, like, in a nutshell, a co-op, it's a business or an organisation that's owned and controlled by its members. And the idea is that the members of a co-op uh, all have a shared need and they come together to fulfill this need and to like make decisions together. Um, 
co-ops can take lots of different forms. Um, cooperatives can be pubs or energy suppliers or taxi firms or sports clubs, um, farms, bookshops, food shops. And the, the members of a cooperative, depending on what the cooperative is, the members can be its customers, they can be the employees of taxi firms, for instance, so workers co-op, uh, they can be the residents of the cooperative, so if it's a housing co-op. Um, yes, so they, they, depending on what the co-op does, the members can have a different relationship to the cooperative. Um, but yes, the, the, the core idea is that cooperatives are owned by the members who are using its services and the members take decisions on how the co-op is run. And this means that the, the co-ops work tend to like, have the potential to work for people better because they're not like it's not owned by distant shareholders who have no idea of what people need and and do on the ground it's it things happen much closer because often actually the people who use this service are part of the co-op so they know what they need if that makes sense so it's the idea of having things much more integrated um, rather than sometimes this relationship that we have with businesses where businesses are owned by shareholders that actually don't really know um, how people's experience on the ground is and who the, the users are. Um, and yes, so it means that co-ops also just don't focus on making a profit because actually it's members of a co-op who decide how the co-op is run and members have their interest at heart and um, so they want to have a good service they want the things to work well and they're not just interested in profit and this means that co-ops very often have the potential to deliver high quality stuff and and to work on things that are important and of value for local communities um, you can, if you want to have a look at the, like all the types of co-ops that exist, you can have a look at Cooperatives UK's website and they have a directory of cooperatives um, with loads of cooperatives across the UK and you can see like the diversity of what co-ops can do is, is huge and the, the size can vary a lot as well. You have very small co-ops, you have big co-ops, um, like everyone knows the co-op supermarket, that's a really big um, members co-op, but you can have also much smaller ones. Um, and yes, in the UK, there are more than 7,000 co-ops. Um, as we saw in the video, the co-ops contribute uh, a lot to the UK economy for £40 billion. Pounds. And um, what's interesting is also that the co-ops are very resilient. Um, so for instance, during the lockdowns in 2021, they were five times less likely to close down than other UK businesses. Um, and also, I think that's a bit our focus for today, is showing you that co-ops are really a great vehicle for collective action, which is particularly important when we talk about climate change, because climate change is really about people getting together um, to realize their power to do things and to change the system. And cooperatives are a really good way and vehicle to do that. Um, and it's really about bringing people together and getting them to achieve more together than what they would do on their own. And also, to take back control of things that have very often been, you know, take the control has been taken away from uh, by big companies. And you can see that with the examples about pubs, um, you know, we've got big pub chains or taxi firms, Uber or a sports club owned by a big um, conglomerates. Um, Co-ops is really about taking back these things that really are very important to us. Um, and yeah, having this, this control. Um, yeah, so about like co-op members, so as we explained, um, members can have a different relationship to, to the co-op. It can be customers, employees, residents or suppliers. Um, but really what matters is that members of a cooperative put something in, in terms of their time, uh, their involvement, um, and then they also get something out of being involved. Um, this something out can take different forms. Uh, it can take, you know, if, if you're a member of a food co-op, a food shop co-op, you can maybe get a discount on what you're buying. If you're a member of an energy co-op, maybe you can get a, a dividend, like a, a return on investment if you're invested. Um, if you're in a workers co-op, it can take loads of different forms. But yes, the idea as a mem a cooperative benefits its members. So as a member, you get a benefit from being in a cooperative. And they also, cooperatives function in a democratic way. The idea is that members have an equal say. So for instance, the, the energy co-ops I work with, 
uh, people invest together to purchase like solar panels, for instance. Um, and once we create a co-op, everyone has the same say on what we do, like with the cooperative, whether people have invested a hundred or 10,000 pounds, it doesn't matter. We operate on a one vote, one member basis. Um, and this is also something very important in a cooperative because it's this idea of collective collective power rather than shareholders who you know have a bigger say if they've invested a lot of money that's not what co-ops are about um so that's about members and yes so the the core of what we want to talk about today is cooperatives uh, and climate action and how cooperatives are really a great vehicle um, to do stuff for the climate. Um, two thirds of the cooperatives in the UK are currently taking action to reduce carbon emissions. And this compares to just 30% of the UK's top 100 companies who currently pledge to eliminate their carbon emissions by 2050, knowing that we don't really know what that means and if that's going to happen, because there's a big difference between pledging and actually doing things. Um, and it does make sense that this is the case because cooperatives are not like the, the the main point of cooperatives is not to make profit but to benefit people so there is going to be like a bigger tendency on trying to do stuff for for the climate and the local communities than the big companies you know would be incentivized to do um so co-ops can address climate action in loads of different ways and the idea of today is also to show you like a few practical ways um uh, to do that but some co-ops maybe don't necessarily have anything to do directly with climate change, but can make commitments in the running of their business to protect the environment. Um, some co-ops can be directly like involved in climate action. And for instance, cooperatives are a great like, vehicle to deliver community energy projects. And we're going to talk about that a bit today. Um, and I think what is interesting as well is just I do feel like cooperatives, because of the way they function, because this idea of democracy, of like, empowerment of citizens of like community ownership they do encourage action on climate change anyway because it just shows people how we can get together to do things that we thought we wouldn't be able to do um, and climate action is really about bringing people together and people to realize the power that they have to change the system and cooperatives are a really good way to show that so just by existing, just by being involved in a co-op, I do believe that it can also show people that they have more, more power than what they think. Um, and that's really important when we talk about climate action. Um, so I am, I'm just checking if I'm okay with time because I'm not, I'm not so used to doing these things. So yes, I, um, we get into the like case study section, sort of. So um, myself, Jonathan and Ben, we're going to tell you a bit about the co-ops we work for and what we do. Um, and hopefully this is going to be inspiring and, and interesting for you. So I work for Repowering London and Repowering London, we are a community energy organization. Um, we are a community benefit society, which is a form of cooperative. And what we do is that, um, yeah, our thing is community energy. So basically we, create local energy. Uh, we give London communities the power to create, control and benefit from renewable energy. Um, our main goal is to make sure that uh, Lond all Londoners play an active part in the transition to a fair and inclusive low carbon society. And we do this in like different ways. So this is what we call our toolkit. We have like different, different type of work that we do. Um, one of the big things we do is we basically we help people set up community energy cooperatives. So we ourselves are a community benefit society and we help people around London to create their own community benefit societies to set up renewable energy projects. So far, these projects have mostly been installing solar panels on housing estates and community buildings. Um, but in the future, we will be looking at different technologies and, and doing more stuff. But so far, um, we basically help people set up, setting up community energy cooperatives. We have eight energy cooperatives across London and they all have solar panels on different roofs in different neighborhoods um, and they do some cool stuff with the, the money that they make. But I'll tell you a bit more about the model after. Um, we also have innovation pilots. So we're looking at how 
basically we want our, our community energy projects to be at the forefront of the energy transition. And we know that our energy systems are going to change. They're going to be more smart and more flexible and more efficient. And we are doing some innovation pilots to see how this could look like in community in the community energy world. Um, so how, how can our community energy cooperatives be at the forefront of the changes that are happening to make sure that these changes benefit the people? Um, we also work on what we call our community support services. So the idea is that we obviously with the community energy cooperatives and the innovation pilots we're sort of trying to build the energy system of the future but we also know that the energy system of today is broken and people are having big problems with their energy today so the community support services is all about helping people like right now in the present as much as we can um, and this takes the form of like giving people some energy tips and helping people who are struggling with their bills as much as we can but also advocating uh, for a better energy policy that protects more vulnerable households and really trying to bring our thing is a lot about lived experiences and trying to bring people, for instance, people who have experienced fuel poverty into policy making. And then uh, a last part of our work is around education and training, because we want to use all these things, these community energy co-ops, these innovation stuff. We want to use these also as opportunity to upskill people and bring in more people into the green sector um, and boost people's employment and, and give people opportunities. So we have like education and training programs, but this is also integrated within what we do. So when we set up community energy cooperatives, we want, we recruit local champions. We want to give people like upskilling and mentoring. So it's all about building people's skills um, so that they can play a part in the low carbon transition and, and really empower citizens so that they can have a voice in what's going on in the energy system and can help deliver a meaningful change to it. Um, so that's what we do. And yes, I, I was thinking, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the, the community energy model that we use and how it works. Um, so maybe some of you are familiar with how these projects work, but just in case, um, yes, that's just a high level overview. Um, basically, the, the way the community energy projects work so we set up a community benefit society, which, as I explained, is a form of cooperative. Um, and we get people together to invest in the community benefit society. And once we've got enough money before that, we try and identify a project that we want to do, obviously. So often in our case, it's finding a roof to install solar panels. Once we raise enough money, uh, we install the solar panels on the site that we identified and the, the solar panels belong to the cooperative. So everyone who invested uh, in the cooperative is a member. And then once we've got the solar panels up on a roof, uh, we sell the electricity to the site. And with the income that we get, uh, we do different things. We pay the, the investors back with a small return. Uh, we cover the administration cost of the cooperative because it's like a business. It needs to be run and like managed. Um, but also any surplus profit after that is being put in a community benefit fund. And the idea is that this community fund benefits the community as a whole which is why, and I'm not going to go into much detail for that, but which is why we are community benefit societies and not cooperatives, because the idea is that the community benefit societies not only benefit the members, so in this case, not only the investors in the project, but also every, like the whole community. Um, yes, I don't, I'm not going to get to, like, to, <laughs> I could talk about this for hours, but I would say, just in case of, uh, yeah, just about the, the community energy model and, and these cooperatives. Um, I think what's interesting talking about cooperatives, because that's what the, this webinar is about. Um, I think what's interesting and challenging for me as a, because I'm the community engagement manager at Rebaring, is how do we get, you know, a diverse, uh, like loads of a diverse membership, basically. How do we get young people involved in these cooperatives? How do we get like loads of people who never heard about cooperatives before uh, to get involved in these things? Because these are the people that we also want to bring on board and cooperatives are not necessarily that well known um, among loads of people. So, yeah, a big part of my role is trying to make these projects like very grassroots and bottom up. But that also means um, trying to like get new people on board and, and make these things more, yeah, more like easy to understand and, and appealing for everyone. I can see that someone raised their hand, I think. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know if you want to put your question in the chat and maybe we can come to it after uh, when we do the Q&A. Um, yes, so next slide. I just wanted to finish about um, the power of community energy um, because why, why do I think that this is really great? And um, yeah, I think community energy really has the power to make our energy system green and, and more efficient. And the reason for that, as we, we touched uh, we touched on it a bit before, because cooperatives uh, and community energy groups are like powered by people, there are more. It's more likely that, that they will take action on things that matter to us because it's not working. It's not for profit. Uh, it's for people. Um, so, yeah, that's. I think that's like the the main reason why I think that community energy uh, and and energy cooperatives will help us tackle the climate and the energy crisis. And community energy can also make energy more affordable and fair. And that's really important today in the context of the energy crisis because we're in an energy system that's dominated by big companies rather than by community energy groups run by the people. Um, but if we had more community energy groups, uh, we would be able to have, you know, like better energy prices, make energy more affordable for people. Um, and also because people would be more involved in their energy system, it would be like democratically owned and, and run. And I think that's obviously really important in today's context. And yes, like community energy, obviously it's it's like it's a different type of energy system than what we know today, because the energy system of today is very is dominated by six big companies. It's big gas power plants, it's quite centralized. Community energy is all about again this idea of taking this power and distributing it among people. So this means that it's going to be much more decentralized, much more small scale renewable energy stations, much closer to people, which means that people have more of an incentive and an interest in also getting involved in them. Um, and yeah, I, I read, I had some like interesting stats about the fact that community energy co-ops, for instance, um, I think these are stats from Community Energy England, but community energy co-ops, they are four to five times better than corporates at engaging people on energy efficiency. And that's probably simply because cooperatives are much closer to people. So they tend to be more trusted among local communities. Um, and community energy projects also deliver 12 to 13 times the community benefit of commercial energy installations. Um, and I think the last thing I wanted to finish on is uh, also about this social energy because cooperatives are also just a really good way to bring people together. Uh, doesn't really matter if it's on energy or food or housing. It's just an amazing way to get people to talk to each other because these are all services that we need to survive, whether it's energy, food or housing. And it's just a really good way to bring loads of people in the same room that wouldn't necessarily talk otherwise and, and generate really the social energy that's necessary if we want to create change in our society. And I will end on that and I will pass on to Jonathan from Carbon Co-op so that he can tell us more about what he does with community energy in Manchester. <laughs> Hi there, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Is that all right, Ava? Yes, Brilliant. Can you well. Yeah, so my name is Jonathan. I'm one of the co-founders at Carbon Co-op. And um, yeah, I'm here today to talk about cooperatives and climate action. And what I'm going to do is talk a bit about my background and how I got involved in cooperatives in the first place. I'll talk a bit about why um, co-ops are important around climate change and echoing some of the, some of the points already made by Eva. I'll try not to duplicate. I'll talk about the work that Carbon's Co op doing uh, uh, as well and how that kind of works into that and, and why we're a cooperative and why that makes a difference. So, just a little bit about myself. Um, so, um, yeah, I come from an environmental background. I um, was really alarmed to hear about climate change and the, and the, and the coming climate crisis when I was growing up in the, in the early 90s. I particularly was concerned about things like peat and the natural environment and what have you. And um, I went to university and I studied climate science. And um, it's actually quite a frustrating thing uh, to do, actually, because um, as a scientist, you were taught that your job was to document, not to intervene and not to make change. And obviously, in an in a area like uh, climate change, um, you, you're really alarmed by, the, by what's happening. You want to make a difference. And, 
one of my professors, he'd seen his expertise in peat, he'd seen it destroyed, you know, some of the, the key kind of prime peat areas in the UK. And I, I felt really disempowered by that. I became involved in environmental direct action and protest movements like Reclaim the Streets. But actually, one of the things that really changed my life was when I left university, I got a job at Ethical Consumer Magazine. And Eva's talked about the different types of cooperatives. Ethical Consumer Magazine, which is like a, a an ethical witch guide where, where you look at different products and different household things and look at them and their environmental performance and also the ethical performance of the companies involved. And ethical consumers run as a worker co-op. And for me, at the age of 21, coming out of university, feeling quite disempowered and disenchanted, it was fantastic because I felt immediately like I was involved in something that was creating change. I was trusted and became a, a director at the age of 22. Um, I learned all kinds of different skills and, and competencies as well. And it taught me how to run a company and how to run a cooperative as well. And those things, they're the same things, but they're also different. And um, so for me, it was a great education and, uh, and a fantastic co-op to be part of. So a bit, a bit later on in my life, I've worked at all sorts of different cooperatives. Some of the ones that he was talking about uh, consumer cooperatives, uh, householder co-ops, I worked with them anyway, um, and, and all sorts of things, and worked with organisations to set up co-ops. But yeah, Carbon Co-op came about in the mid-2000s, um, and the kind of motivation was twofold, really. Uh, firstly, um, my, my co-conspirator, Nick Dodd, who was at a worker co-op called Urbed, um, he was concerned about government action and how governments could create change. And he was frustrated that governments always think about top down, big kind of levers that they can pull that will create large scale change. And often what happens is they want to do something large scale and it doesn't work often because they're kind of imposing a solution upon people, uh, householders or, or citizens and what have you. Um, he felt that a bottom-up solution uh, to climate change, a modular solution that worked at a street level and then worked upwards uh, through federation and growth, cooperative federation, would be more effective than a top-down approach. For myself, uh, like Eva was talking about, I was a community activist at the time, and I was concerned about the energy transition that was happening and concerned that uh, communities were both not involved in that transition in terms of dictating where it would go and having a say, but also being able to benefit from it and to generate resources and, and economic activity. And, and a cooperative brought together both our concerns, a, a bottom-up approach to tackling climate change, scaling through replication, not through some big top-down kind of approach, and community empowerment that was both around decision-making but also resource. And I think that's one thing to highlight about cooperatives. They are what some people frame as a social enterprise. They have social, environmental, uh, and people-centred um, outcomes and motivations, but they also have a trading element to them. They are a trading organisation. That's one of the things that makes a cooperative different from a, from a charity or a purely voluntary sector organisation. So that was some of the footing around Carbon Co-op. And um, we, we, started, uh, we started engaging people, we built a, a critical mass of people, members, uh, and launched a co-op back in 2011 now. Um, the benefits of cooperative action, kind of what, why is Carbon Co-op a cooperative? Um, for a number of reasons, really. And I think looking back on cooperative action, um, co-ops have always come together, have always been around people coming together for mutual benefit. And they've often been come about as a result of where governments can't or won't act. And the original co-op founders back in Rochdale acted because they didn't have access to good quality food and drink and other staples and they built their own and I think this is a similar thing where there is a lack of uh, concrete action that people can take around climate change so we created a cooperative for people to come together to access technical resources expertise uh, finance funding projects and all that sort of thing so that they can people can access more than they can alone just working alone um, and secondly, really, to come together as a group of people, really, uh, people taking action and 
um, sharing expertise, experience, we call it peer learning or peer support. And that's, we're a community benefit society, similar to as Ava was talking about. And, and that's how we operate. We, we enable people to come together to take collective action and it's concrete actual action, uh, but they're, they're doing it collectively. And um, there's some really interesting work around climate change. The fact that people, when they work on their own, they feel atomized and alone and they don't feel empowered to take action against climate change because it's so big. When people come as part of a collective endeavor, a cooperative, they feel empowered and they feel they can do stuff. So that's why we're a cooperative. And what we do, we, we do a number of lots of different things. We've got lots of different projects. We're now uh, 20 members of staff and we have uh, nearly 500 members. Uh, mostly in, in Greater Manchester and the Northwest, and we do a number of things. Um, historically, we've always worked around retrofit, retrofitting homes and energy efficiency, in part because we know that this is an area that's not being tackled, and we want to demonstrate what's possible and the ambition, and how by working together, people can, can do more around retrofit. And recently, last year, we established a one-stop shop for retrofit, a new community benefit society, People Powered Retrofit. We also work uh, very much around innovation and research and development, similar to repowering, and we're developing uh, demand side response uh, uh, technologies in the home. Basically, the ability to shift how and when we use energy to match how and when we generate energy through renewable sources as well, uh, which is a new and emerging area for the energy system. It's uh, and one that's ever more relevant this winter. And thirdly and finally, we do a lot around advocacy and um, uh, helping people and communities to talk to and to influence uh, policymakers. For example, we ran a citizen jury uh, this summer around the governance of a local energy market that the uh, combined authority, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority run here in Greater Manchester. So yeah, we do, we do all those different types of things, but fundamentally it's all about taking action on climate change, doing it collectively. And, and thirdly and finally, we have like a fundamental uh, commitment to energy justice, to rebalancing some of the injustices that we see in our society. So that's Carbon Co-op. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for listening and, and I'm around if there's any questions after. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and now we're going to hear about the, the third example. And uh, yes, I'll I'm introducing you to Ben, who's the founder of Bristol, Bristol Wood Recycling Project. Hi, and thanks. then I'll let you share your slides. Thanks, Eva, and thank you, Jonathan. So, Bristol Wood Recycling Project was founded in 2004, and it was in an attempt to address the vast amount of waste that goes on within the construction sector. Um, every day, thousands of tonnes of wood is, is uh, being thrown into skips and effectively... Uh, being made unusable in terms of how, as a community asset. Um, and Bristol Wood Recycling Project was created to address some of that waste and to create community value from that waste as well. So uh, here I am, look at that. I haven't aged much, have I? That was 18 years ago, 18 and a half years ago. And that's me with my co-director, Nicola Padden. And uh, we were lucky enough to have access to a uh, council owned building that was expected to be demolished at, at any time soon. Um, and um, we were able to move in there on a peppercorn rent. And the first thing that we did was buy a, a van. You can't quite tell how rusty and old this one uh, was. But yeah, on its first voyage, the actual engine blew up on the motorway. That was an additional cost that was unexpected. Um, but this vehicle enabled us to go to construction sites, uh, to house builders, to people who were throwing wood out of their gardens, to go to the universities, to go to industrial units where, where wood was going to waste and, and collect that wood. Um, and the Bristol Wood Recycling Project model is based around trying to reuse as much of the wood as possible um currently we reuse about a third of what we collect and every day we're collecting about two tons of wood um so 
you know, we, we, we're looking at, at hundreds of tonnes a year that we, we are collecting and we're able to reuse. And that wood that we reuse brings massive uh, value to the local community, but also it brings value to the environment. Um, it's a bit of a kind of perverse way of describing it, but that wood that uh, if we weren't collecting it, it would be going into a, um, a mixed skip um, and it would be pulverised and it would probably be either turned into chipboard or it would be incinerated. Um, and that incineration is called combined, is called energy from waste. Um, and when you think about the fact that a quarter of what we collect is reusable, if we weren't there to collect that and reuse that, that 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 would just be lost, and all of the embodied carbon in that wood, uh, the lives of those those trees have gone into growing that, the habitats that they come from, also all go up in smoke. So our endeavour to try and reuse as much as possible really brings value to that that to that environmental. Um, the cost of wasting this wood. Um, this is uh, an old photo as well. These are the kind of customers that we have because we're based in central Bristol. Um, we actually have an awful lot of footfall and a lot of people who are, who are coming um, either on foot or they're coming on bikes or more, more recently they're coming on little scooters and they're able to buy wood and take it away in that way, um, which is a, a great sort of low carbon way of, of affecting change as well. Um, in... 2012 we were faced after having occupied our site for for um eight years um and this was bearing in mind that we were expecting to be there for just a few months um and these months were going on because the whole area was due to be developed there was to be a, an arena in the area bristol arena uh, the whole of the area was was termed an enterprise zone which i'm sure you're all familiar with here is a, a photo of me meeting the uh, the prime minister at the time david cameron um you can see i'm dressed as my best for the for the occasion and having a good conversation with him um and we knew that our time at cattle market road was was limited um and but this kind of the tenure that we had on this site rolled on and on and then eventually we sort of got our marching orders we heard that the writing was on the wall that we would have to vacate the area uh, we'd have to leave our, our then home for it was it, we were heading towards 13 years actually by the time we actually had to move out of it um but this really created a shift for us and we had to had to gear up um at this stage we'd also change into a cooperative um now jonathan mentioned earlier social enterprise and that's what we are we are a social enterprise we have a triple bottom line it's called we have a we uh, are a business so we have to make money to to um to, to pay our wages we've got 13 employees to pay the rent and um, to pay for our services but we also really value the social and environmental impact that we create how many tons of wood are we reusing how many volunteers are we working with we we have volunteers from all sorts of backgrounds coming to help us out from uh retired university lecturers to people in recovery from from substance abuse issues um so we really measure our impact by who gets involved um and we had also by 2012 turned into a cooperative which we uh we thought after having been a kind of a traditional hierarchical organization with a, a, a management committee of directors uh, and recruiting different different people and them coming and going we actually turned into a, a cooperative which was close to a workers co-op it's we're actually a multi-stakeholder co-op so that we have workers having uh, once they pass their probation they turn into co-op members but we also have volunteers who understand the culture and business of the organization they can become members as well and then we come together in general meetings and annual general meetings things to decide on the direction of the business and 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 um and, and choose where we're going back in 2012 and then onwards until we actually moved out in, in 2017 uh, it was a very slow process but we geared up to the challenge of finding our our new location and um we actually managed to find a place um uh, just just 
800 meters away from our old site and this photo is a, a, a picture of some of our employees and some of our volunteers the members of the cooperative and this is after we raised 430,000 pounds through Triodos Bank to purchase our site now Triodos Bank uh, it's great for us to be working with them because they as a lender uh, and this isn't a plug for them it's just like who do we choose to go with it could be we have a current account with the co-op bank but we also bank with Triodos Bank and they invest solely in environmental and social projects so for us to raise money through them and we raise this as it's something called a bond issue. So we we pay back all of the investors um, at 4% a year over the space of six years. And with that money, we're able to buy this property. Um, and working with Triodos, we know that we have um, the, the, the money that we've also uh, we've invested in the share and the profit that's generated also goes to support that organization which is part of a, a low carbon future so here is all of us celebrating having moved into our new home uh this is a picture of it from the front um you know i think uh, what Eva was saying earlier was about like climate action is about people getting about bringing people together in cooperatives and I think that having community owned buildings and buildings and places that are beautiful and uh, places where people participate engenders this uh, citizenship that uh, allows us to believe that we're actually part of change and part of being able to make a difference and us being able to own this building and um, and transform it externally and internally has had huge impact on everyone who comes and gets involved be it volunteers employees customers the people that we collect wood from and that, that i believe really furthers an agenda of a positive vision of change and, and a low carbon future um also as a cooperative okay so we've we've got you know it's a big financial commitment for us um pounds which we're slowly paying um interest on and we've got a six-year term and then we're gonna have to raise money again to extend that um so we can effectively get a mortgage on this building but as we deal every quarter and every year with these kind of the financial implications of oh, bottom if you can hear noises of work behind them um um i'm in a busy busy yard with wood getting chopped up um as we as we work towards the completion of our loan we also start to talk about okay what more can we do to further our social environmental objectives so this big roof which unfortunately is covered in asbestos so that's going to be a tricky one for us to put solar panels on but um behind we have further roof space which we can start putting solar panels on uh here we go here's a photo of this extension that we made from lovely douglas fir that's locally sourced um and here's some of the wood that we have piled up in this this roof with its led lights um we hope to be getting solar power panels on on those soon um Here's a final photo sort of, of what we get up to. This is the size of the yard. This is the, all the wood you see here. All of this is saved from, from waste. Um, by having volunteers involved, by having employees who have that sense of ownership and direction and permanence within a really uncertain world, you know, this is our home. This isn't going anywhere. And everyone is participating during the, our business is self-financing and and generating its own future means that people have that sense of ownership and agency within where we are going and that trickles down to every single person who comes and visits from the clients who get wood from to the customers who buy wood from us and we've been a part of bristol social history for the last 18 years and i imagine that we're going to be part of it for for however long we can which at least another 18 years and i think many more times than that uh so yeah that's that's bristol wood recycling project and, and our participation in this um carbon neutral future thank you thank you ben yeah it's super inspiring it is really great to see like very practical examples um from yourself in wood recycling and from jonathan in retrofit um, on how cooperatives like can do can do stuff for the climate and how how well it works. Um, now, before we get on to questions from attendees, I will just share my screen again and tell you a little bit more about the Hive, which is 
again, let me, um, which is the business uh, development program that is supporting the series of webinars. Um, so yeah, maybe you're thinking this is really inspiring and you want to set up uh, your own cooperative, or maybe you've got a business and you want to transform it into a cooperative, or maybe you, so, you know someone who is interested in maybe creating a cooperative. Um, in any case, um, Cooperatives UK is a, a great place to start. Um, I personally, all the cooperatives, the community energy cooperatives that I work with around London are all registered with Cooperatives UK. Um, it's a big, ne big network of cooperatives across the UK and um, their role is really to support you in creating and developing and running uh, your cooperative. So you can go on their website um, and they've got this cool program, um, which is delivered in collaboration with the Cooperative Bank and it's called The Hive. And I'll just show you a bit what The Hive is about and how you can use it. Um, it's basically a, a support for any new or existing co-op. Um, and it's they've got like loads of free online resources and they've got some business support that you can apply for. So if you go on the website, you've got this like step by step co-op creation tool. So you can just go through the steps. You don't even have to have a co-op to create right now. You can just go through the steps um, and look at the different resources that Co-ops UK has. And it gives you a bit of an idea of the things you need to think about if you were to set up a cooperative and then register it. And yeah, I, I just strongly, if, if this is something you're interested in, I strongly recommend you to just have a look and see the different steps and different uh, different resources available for each. Um, you can get like the, the really cool thing about the, the Hive program is that you can get some business support and you so you've got access to up to 10 days of tailored business support. And that includes getting one-to-one -one advice from a co-op development expert. Um, and also maybe some peer mentoring from an experienced cooperative. And you can also access training from Cooperatives UK. Um, they have a lot of training on like basically the running of a cooperative, what it is to be a cooperative director. How do you like, you know, put together financial accounts for a cooperative? What the, the kind of legal stuff that you have to think about? Um, the admin, how do you engage with your members and stuff like that? Um, and uh, yeah, I think this, the business development tool is really useful because to start a co-op, it does require a bit of work and a bit of knowledge. And um, this, you know, it can go from like deciding the most appropriate type of co-op, that type of co-op that you're going to use. As we mentioned, like there are, you can use a cooperative, community benefit societies, uh, community interest companies, like there are different structures and it's very useful to think early on about what structure serves your purpose best. Um, and then you can also get support at uh, the, how you set up the governance of your co-op, what are your rules going to look like, how you're going to run it, how you're going to make decisions, um, how you're going to incorporate, so how you're going to register your co-op, um, what type of members are you going to try and get, how you're going to involve your members, um, so like designing an engagement plan to engage with your membership, and also how you're going to run your business because Ben and Jonathan said it well, but like it's it's about business, co-ops are about also trading, actually doing things. It's not charities, so you need a business plan um, and you can use some of this business support to do that, testing out your ID and how you're going to raise finance and how you're going to make this like financially viable. Um, and yes, from with Co-ops UK, you can get also some skills training and peer mentoring um, with other cooperatives, which can also enable you to network. And then, like I think what's great with Cooperative UK is it's a big network of co-ops and it's just also really good to share learnings uh, with other cooperatives and yeah, learn from each other really. So I think that's it in terms of the Hive. Um, all the links are in the chat if you want to have a look. And yeah, we've got eight, yes, we've got eight minutes left for questions. Um, I think I'll just stop sharing. And I can see there are already two questions in the chat. Um, there's one question for you, Sam, from Petra. Thank you, Petra, for your question. Uh, you chose more of a multi-stakeholder rather than a community benefit society. Would you consider changing to a model that would allow community share offer wider investors and members? Yeah, um, Petra. Yeah, great, juicy question. Um, and it's it's Ben. Um, and yeah, I mean, 
at that stage where we were out of having to find a new location, actually restructuring the organization in terms of its, its, its company, company structure didn't feel like an appropriate thing. We had enough of a mountain to climb to try and deal with that. Um, but in terms of evolution to a community benefit society, um, I personally would be open to that. But this would have to be led by the members uh, within the cooperative. Um, I, I I like that idea and you know you put a little seed in, in in my mind to start discussing it with some of my other co-op members but it's um it's kind of framed within the the capacity of everything else that goes on here at, because we're a social enterprise and generating the income through going out and into building sites and collecting wood or having a big yard where we sell timber or having a big busy workshop making stuff um sometimes this more sort of heady stuff gets gets um relegated a little bit that's not to say it's not important but it kind of falls after the the operational stuff but i think that's a really cool question i i will um i'll take it to to some of my colleagues and and chat about it because i think it's a nice idea and certainly has has room for exploration so yeah thank you petra great it's like a two-way a two-way webinar two-way workshop and learning that's cool um a question for you jonathan also from Petra, what has been the scale and some examples of the retrofitting you have done across Greater Manchester? Yeah, so, yeah. so we uh, focus um, on deep retrofit, which is uh, multiple kind of improvements uh, applied to a property together. And the reason to do that is to um, have a holistic plan for a property um, so that you don't do stuff now and have to take it out again. Um, you can do it in stages, you can do it in one big bang. Um, we've um, specialised in like in those deep retrofit projects as well because they're not, not things that other people are doing and not to um, diss what they're doing, but to say we're trying to show ambition and what co-ops can achieve. So in terms of the properties, we did a big, we did a big program where the average cost of the property of the upgrade was £40,000. Um, the, we cut the gas use and the space heating demand in half, uh, carbon emissions by 60%. Uh, people on average reduced energy bills by £1,000 a year, and that's in kind of old money. And we're left with bills after the retrofit of a, of a few hundred pounds, uh, no more than that. So, yeah, that's the kind of scale of retrofit we're aiming for. There are other approaches as well that are to be encouraged as well, because we need multi-pronged approach to this kind of challenge. Thanks, Jonathan, for the examples. Um, another question for you, Ben. Um, are you quite unique in what you do in this sector as a co-op and would you support new ones? Yeah, um, certainly my computer's telling me my internet state, my internet connection is unstable, so apologies. We can hear you. Sorry if I get a bit glitchy. Um, yeah, we are quite unique in terms of uh, wood recycling run as a cooperative. Um, we are part of an umbrella, a national umbrella called Community Wood Recycling. And there are different wood recycling projects throughout the country. So in Oxford and Cambridge and Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, Manchester even, you know. So we've got, there are, it's, um, there are different social enterprises doing this. We are the only one that is run as a cooperative. Um, so yeah, we are unique in that way. And, and trying to figure out this, uh, governance model of participation of the different membership groups is, you know, it's 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 a terrain to uh, be traversed, and sometimes it's best taken on by people who are familiar with the cooperative uh, model. So, you know, it, I've spoke Leeds Wood Recycling, for instance, have talked about turning into a co-op. So, you know, it's it's got to be led by the by the employees themselves, I think. Um, but it's definitely a place for growth, and there's interest in it. Thank you, Ben. Um, another question from Christopher. Um, Co-ops often struggle with funding and getting capital. Are plans to expand or is it more just to be sustainable and to keep going without seeking growth? Good question. Who's um, that for? Um, just a general question. So mm -hmm. What if you want to do? I think, I mean, Ben will talk, I'm sure, because it was interesting to hear that he'd used bonds like um, 
debt um, to, to, to raise capital. There are lots of different ways that co-ops can do, can raise capital. You know, we're, we're, it's similar to a, a company we can take on debt and, and, and borrowing and that sort of thing. We can also, through community benefit societies, raise money through equity investment, so-called community shares. You know, so actually there's lots of different ways that we can do that. I think one of the ways we can't raise capital is through venture capital investment, where like a, a venture capitalist puts loads of money into us and then hopes to kind of exit with a, a profit. To me, that's actually an advantage because that kind of quick kind of, um, you know, fire sale capitalism doesn't help yeah. the long term challenges we have in, in tackling climate change. Yeah, I, th I think that's also a perfect example as why cooperatives are very well suited to do stuff um, in the climate sector. Ben, do you want to come in about that as well? Uh, yeah, I think it's great what Jonathan just said uh, there. I think that um, we we had to propose moderate growth in order to pay for our debt and then to accrue more capital so that we could purchase a building in the long run. Um, we will have this interesting place where actually our outgoings in terms of the rent mortgage whatever becomes less and less and then we're left with a, a very nice position of like okay we don't we now what do we start doing with our surplus so as long as we keep on growing um or as long as we keep on doing our thing and, and creating a moderate surplus then actually that puts us in a really extraordinary position of what do we invest mm. in in the future yeah Thanks, Ben. And I was just going to add that um, from my point of view, the, the stuff we do at Rebarring, because we're all about community energy and trying to make community energy very inclusive and we do a lot of engagement. Our cooperatives are not financially sustainable in the sense that their revenues don't cover the cost, like the engagement work that we do. And so we cover a lot of this engagement work through Rebarring with some grant funding. Um, and I think that's fine because it's, you know, it's also sometimes different work um and yeah on your question christopher how many investors does each organization have uh, i can just tell you for the co-ops that i work with um i would say each community energy cooperative so we have around eight each of them has between 60 to 150 investors something like that who are all members um but not everyone is necessarily like engaged in the day-to-day -day running of the cooperative so each of our cooperatives maybe has like 15 20 people who are like highly engaged um in its day-to-day -day running um i don't i don't know if you want to come in on that ben ben and jonathan of the the members you've got to give an idea of the scale so we've got 450 members of carbon co-op um and they pay 35 pounds a year so they pay a little bit um to kind of be part of something bigger tackling climate change and then we've got 350 investor members of people powered retrofit and that's been part of a community share issue to establish that um i don't know the figures off the top of my head of how many investors we've got uh within 430,000, but the the investment range is from 50 quid to twenty thousand pounds um and we managed to raise that 430 grand in in two weeks. Well, that's cool. Well done. Um, I know there was another question in the chat, but I'm conscious it's one past two when the webinar was supposed to finish at two. So thank you so much to all the participants um, for listening in. Hope you found it inspiring and useful. You've got loads of links in the chat, but also you can look at COPS UK's website. Um, and yes, um, looking forward to hear from some of you. And yeah, hope you find this session interesting and you're going to take some stuff away to do things in your area. Bye, everyone.